Hey, you found the podcast. It was uh, hopefully not too difficult to find because you can listen to it a lot of different places, including our new app that you can find on Android or iPhone. But uh, you found it. And today we're talking about how to braise or solder anything. And this episode is brought to you by Solder Weld. Solder Weld makes a great line of products specifically for the HVAC industry. They make a kit with everything in there that you could really possibly need as an HVAC technician to do a good job at fixing leaks or making joint connections out there in HVAC. If you want to do it the right way, you want to do it with your torches, you can do it with Solder Weld. And you can find out more by going to productsbypros.com. They have a bunch of information there on how to get Solder Weld into local distribution because that's the goal. You want it to be on the shelf. Solder is not something that you probably would rather buy online. Although if you do want to, you can find all the Solder Weld products at truetechtools.com. Use the offer code get schooled for a discount. And they make a bunch of good stuff. They make a really great product called Alloy Saw for patching aluminum, aluminum coils. They make something for aluminum two copper called Alcop Braze. They make 15% solder, 56% flux coated rod. They make a really good low temperature solder called Multi Saw. They've got a little bit of everything there at Solder Weld. So check that out if you want. But today we're talking about how to braze or solder anything and just some of the things you want to think about. And so I'm not going to go over the techniques for every specific type of brazing application, but rather let's talk about the things you need to know. So what are some of the things you need to think about? So first thing to think about is the base metal that you're going to be working on. And when it comes to working on different types of base metals, certain base metals don't work with certain types of fluxing agents. So you have to have a flux that's going to match both the temperature and the base metal. And probably the best example of this is that we use phosphorus in rods like our 15%, 5%, 0% phos copper rods that we use are silphos rods. They have phosphorus in it. So if there's phos in the name, you know it has phosphorus. And steel doesn't work with phosphorus. They're not happy. They don't react properly. So while copper, copper to copper, we don't need to use flux. You know this. If you're connecting a condenser, you notice you don't use flux. That's because the phosphorus inside those silphos or phos copper rods act as the fluxing agent. And so you don't need flux. But if you're going to be working with steel, then you can't use a phosphorus rod. You use a high silver rod, and then you use a separate flux. So you need to know some stuff about just the basic properties of how your base metal is fluxed. And flux just means kind of acts as a cleaning agent. It helps to absorb or counteract oxides that build up as you heat the base metals. And so it kind of keeps it clean and allows that solder or, or brazing alloy to bond. Also, quickly, a lot of people wonder what the difference between brazing and soldering is. And it's just really temperature. When you get above, I think it's 850 degrees, it's either 850 or 860 then it's brazing, and when you're below that, it's soldering. So it's just the temperature. Either way, you're using a alloy or a separate metal that is not the same as the base metal or either of the base metals if you're joining two dissimilar metals together. For those of us who are used to working with copper, copper has some really nice properties for joining it. It's very conductive of heat, so you can kind of heat it in one spot, and the heat travels all the way around the copper, which is why if you've ever worked with soft solder, you'll notice that you don't even need to wrap the solder around. You just heat the pipe, get the flux to the right temperature, and you just push the solder in, and it wraps all the way around the joint. So that's one of the characteristics of soft solder is that you don't have to work it around the way that we typically have to when you're working with silver solder. And that's because copper is very conductive, so it moves heat. And so when you're comparing other types of metals, really almost no metals are going to be as conductive as copper that we work with. Obviously, if you're working with gold or silver, but we don't do that. So if you're working with steel, for example, steel is not nearly as conductive as copper. And what that means is, is that when you put heat in one spot, it's going to localize in that one spot. And you'll notice that with steel. When you put heat in one area, it kind of gets hot in that one area. It doesn't spread out as much, so you got to move the torch a little bit more when you're working with steel, or you just apply the heat to the copper, and then that kind of conducts it into the joint. And so there's just different factors with conductivity, and you want to think about that as how does that heat move with the metal that you're working on. The other thing is you have to think about expansion and contraction. When you have certain metals that expand more than others or expand less than others, then that's going to impact them as you braze the joint. So if you're working with something like copper to steel, when you heat the copper, the copper is going to expand more or brass is going to expand more than the steel. And so you want to think about that with your joint clearances is that as you heat it, it's going to spread out and it's going to get tighter together. And in general, we like to think, all right, well, you want as tight a clearance as you can possibly get. You want it really, really tight. Well, sometimes you actually don't want it too tight because then that restricts the capillary action. Because the goal, what we're trying to accomplish when we're soldering or brazing, is we're trying to draw that base metal into the joint. We're trying to get it all the way in there. And we don't want to get too much because in the case of some types of solders, they can actually pull in and kind of puddle inside the line. And then you'll have these little beads 
that are inside the tubing, and that's definitely no good with HVAC. And in plumbing, you can deal with a little bit of that, but in HVAC, we don't want any of that solder going inside the line. So depending on the type of solder, that's a really important consideration. You want it tight. In some cases, you don't want it too tight. In some cases, if you have it too loose, you're going to pull more material into the joint, which is going to cause contamination or beading inside the line. So those are all things that you have to think about as well before you start making a joint that you're not used to making. In copper, the most common mistake that we make when brazing is just not getting things hot enough. And so with copper, brass, and steel, we have this indicator as you heat it, the base metal changes color and it gets to what we call cherry red. And cherry red is generally between 12 and 1300 degrees in both steel and copper. And so when you get it to that temperature, that's about the perfect temperature to flow most silver solders. Most of them are somewhere between 1100 and 1250 degrees in that range. That's about the perfect range. And so you want to get it to that temperature and then you want to kind of hold it there. You don't want to get it too hot and you don't want to let it cool down too much because you want that solder to draw into the joint, not just create a cap weld. A lot of technicians, they essentially put the flame right on their rod and they just sort of melt little bridges of solder on top of the joint. And they think that's a good looking joint when they have a nice little pretty cap or fillet on top and they haven't necessarily gotten the entire joint hot enough brings us to our next point. You got to know the melting temperatures of your base metals, or at least generally speaking, what the melting temperatures are. You don't want to get them over the temperature that they might melt. And so as an example, we'll just give you some basic ideas here. You've got steel that doesn't melt until 2,500 degrees. Copper is about 1950. Brass is a little less than that. But then you have aluminum that it can actually melt at under 1300 degrees. Aluminum doesn't give you that indication of color change like the others do. And so if you're working with aluminum to copper, for example, you'll be heating up the copper thinking that everything's all dandy and then all of a sudden your aluminum is just going to disappear on you. And that's why you've really got to think about what are your indicators for temperature change. And with those lower temperature solders, or lower temperature brazing alloys, usually it's the flux that gives you that indication. If you're working with silver, like if you're doing copper to copper, then what you're going to do is get it to that cherry red, that deep red, not bright red, but just that deep red. And then that tells you that you've got enough heat to draw in your solder, start applying it. But with aluminum to copper, say, or even if you're using a low temperature solder, like for example, multi-sol made by solder weld, it's great solder, but it's very low temperature. And so when you're down in that 600 degree range, four to 600 degree range, you're not going to get that indication with the temperature change on the metal. So you're going to have to rely on the flux. And so let's talk a little bit about flux. There's different types of fluxes. The first thing to think about with flux is what is its temperature range? Every flux is going to publish. Here's the working range of that flux. You have to compare that to the melt temperature of the alloy that you're going to be melting. And those two need to kind of match up so that when that flux goes flat and clear, that's usually when you're ready to apply. That's how most fluxes work. Some change to like a caramel color, depending on the type of flux it is, but they all have an indication that this is now, you're in that temperature range, and now it's time to start applying the rod. Most fluxes have some water in them, especially if they're a liquid flux, and so you'll see that first 212 degrees, that'll boil off, and then it'll change a little bit more, it'll kind of go syrupy, and then it'll go flat and clear, or maybe a caramel color with some liquid fluxes, and then you know you're ready to apply that rod. And so at that point, the flux becomes the indicator. And at that point, you also don't want to overheat the flux. If you burn that flux, well, now you've got to start over because that flux is now going to act as an inhibitor to your alloy or your solder actually bonding. So let's kind of touch base on what we've got here so far. You need to know the melt point of your base metal, at least generally. You need to make sure that your rod is appropriate for the base metal, and you need to know something about when that rod flows out. If you're using a flux, we have to know, do you need a flux or not? Most cases you do, unless you're doing copper to copper. Copper to copper is one of the few cases where you don't need it, but most other applications you are going to need it. So then you're going to need to know what is the operating temperature of the flux and what are the visual cues. And then finally, and I've already mentioned this, is applying the right amount of material with the right gap, the right clearances, so that it's tight, not too tight, the proper amount. Usually you want things to be really clean. There are some exceptions to that, but in most cases you want it to be really clean. You want the surface to be scuffed up. And then you want to apply the right amount of material, but not so much that it's going to pull into the joint. Biggest mistake that I generally see is where technicians do not get the entire joint to the proper temperature before they start applying rod. And this is especially true with low temperature solders where they start applying it and it just starts bubbling off. You've got to get that flux to the right temperature before you start applying. The next thing is thinking about where you place your heat. So as a perfect example, if you're working with aluminum to copper, copper is a little bit more conductive than aluminum. 
it's also the higher temperature of the two. So it's the one that can tolerate the heat a little bit more. So what I usually do is I'll apply my heat onto the copper a little ways away from the joint until it starts to kind of flow at the joint. And now I can move it over and draw it into the aluminum. It just helps protect that aluminum so that I'm not applying heat on just a single spot in that aluminum and potentially burning through it. In general, when you're working with different materials, you usually want to apply a little more heat on the copper because it is a little more conductive. The challenge just becomes that in some cases, like when you're working with steel, because steel doesn't have that conductivity in order to get the heat all around it, I do tend to work with the steel kind of around the steel, just so that way you are making sure that you're getting the steel to temperature all the way around. Because again, it's going to be more prone in the case of steel for the steel to stay cooler because it doesn't have that conductivity. So there's a lot of different factors here, but the main point, the end of the day, is to get that entire joint to the proper temperature. That's what you need to accomplish. Not just the one side, not just the other side, but the entire joint to the proper temperature. Whereas most technicians, they start to focus on just that edge. And it's never just the edge that you're trying to cap. You're always trying to pull into that joint. If you're making a patch on something, like you're making a patch in an existing coil or something where you're not actually doing a full joint, well, that's a little different because now at that point, you really just are laying solder on and that's just sort of bonding to the base metal. That's the case with alloy saw. You can make a really strong bonded patch on an aluminum rub out. And now at that point, it's a little different technique. But in most cases, what we're doing is we're trying to draw it into a joint where we have a fitting, a coupling in a tube. And you need to make sure you get that whole thing to the right temperature. And you got to take account of the melt temperature and the working temperature of your rod, the melting temperature and the kind of the critical temperature of your base metal, the visual indicators your base metal does or doesn't give you. Does it change color, doesn't it? And then also think about what flux you're using. Is it the right one? And what is the working temperature of that flux? Which is a lot of things to think about. But if you think about those things and you know what you're doing, then even without a lot of experience, you're generally going to go in and make a decent bond. It may not be beautiful, but it's not going to leak. And that's a key thing. So hopefully that helps. Thanks for listening. We will talk to you next time on the HVAC School Podcast. And oh, by the way, if you're interested in what Solder World has to offer, go to productsbypros.com and find out more. Have a good one. (laughs) 